Okay. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming today to our panel. Uh, we're excited because we have an operator, Swisscom, who's actually got a live OpenStack platform in production, and it's one of the largest deployments. And we have Marcel here to um, start off by showing us, giving you some background on what it is. And then we will go into a panel session where I'll ask questions. And then at the end, there'll be time for some of your questions. So please go ahead, Marcel. Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay. Um, thanks a lot for showing up. Um, as I said, my name is Marcel Harry. I work at Swisscom. I'm an architect for um, our application cloud. Our application cloud is a platform as a service um, which we run based on Cloud Foundry. We're using Cloud Foundry um, to manage a diversity of workload, and we're deploying Cloud Foundry on top of OpenStack. We also build OpenStack on our own, so we run it, we operate it on, on our own, but we um, came up together with the design and the solution together with our partners here on sta um, stage. Um, um, we're using Red Hat OpenStack as the, as the basis for, for all the core components, and we're using a Plum Grid um, solution for the networking capabilities. So if you look um, at the picture, it looks more or less like that. So on the top, we have um, the platform as a service layer based on Cloud Foundry. We added um, lots of integration um, into the, the various environments. We deploy this platform as a service into um, based on our own development. And then we have also, um, we're also running a couple of services. Um, we're also running a couple of services based on, um, on Docker containers, and we're using Flocker to, for the persistency there. On the infrastructure as a service layer, and this is what we call our elastic um, infrastructure as a service, our elastic stack, it's uh, purely based on OpenStack. Um, we're having um, Quanta hardware underneath, Arista switches, EMC scale IO, but um, then um, the, the large distribution um, part is now Red Hat OpenStack. Um, we have Juno in production and we're rolling out Mitaka into production now. And the networking part, which is kind of very important for us, well, I mean, we're a telco, so um, network is always important. And, and um, there we were using Plum Grid. And um, this really helped us a lot to integrate it into the different environments um, that we're deploying that to. And actually, if I'm talking about different environments, then we're not only deploying one platform as a service, but we're having um, multiple instances of this application cloud. And it's just forwarding. And we're actually deploying multiple instances of this application cloud. Uh, one, I mean, we're eating our own dog food, so we have an internal application cloud where, where all of our developers are able to push their applications and um, have an easy test bed to, to get started with, with what they want to deliver. And then um, we have also bigger internal pro projects like MyCloud. It's a storage offering from Swisscom, like similar to Dropbox, um, for all our residential customers. And actually, everybody can go there and sign up. And this um, platform is, is run purely on our application cloud. And we have a bunch of um, um, virtual private offerings. Um, customers we're, we're having. We're having Dorma Kava, and we're also having Swiss Re as, as, um, um, as one of our customers. And they're moving more and more of their cloud native workloads towards our application cloud. And we were also running a public offering, developer.swisscom.com, and you can go and sign up there, similar to other public platform as a service offerings within. Um, um, all over the world. That's it. Great. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you very much. 
And I should have said at the beginning, I'm Sandra O'Boyle, Senior Analyst with Heavy Reading, though I think you probably gathered uh, which one was me. Um, and um, I'm joined by, if you'd like to introduce yourself, yes, starting I'm, there. Uh, Pedro Monclus, uh, CTO and co-founder at PlumGrid. I'm Chris Wright, uh, Vice President and Chief Technologist at Red Hat. And we know who you are, Marcel. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to start um, with you, Chris, um, in terms of the enhancements to OpenStack. Can you give us um, a brief synopsis what they are and how they make things better for cloud operators like Swisscom in the latest release? Uh, well, the, the, that's kind of a, a big question. Um, well, so, the, t the top three, the top <laughs> four. <laughs> so I think from my point of view, um, where we are in the state of, of OpenStack and the evolution of OpenStack is we're moving towards um, a lot of stable functionality and beyond the kind of base features and then first day deployment. And we're really looking at more and more operational uh, requirements. So how do you help uh, run a cloud in, in, in production uh, and keep it up and do updates and get insights into the infrastructure as you're building it, uh, as you're operating it. Um, to me, that's, that's where we are today in, in the project. And there's always an important set of, of kind of market-specific features that are, that are still coming in. Uh, we've been spending a lot of time working with service providers and operators, um, bringing a, the, the functionality to OpenStack so that you can deploy, um, especially network functions, uh, into OpenStack and have them operate efficiently. And that's largely about virtual machine placement and good packet processing performance um, in, uh, in a virtual machine in an OpenStack deployment. So kind of a high level, but that's my view. And I, I really think it's important that we look at the day two world of, of OpenStack today, because we're not about basic features and we're not about just the, the initial demo uh, install. Great, thank you. I think you did a good job. Um, Chris, um, at PlumGrid, you provide the SDN to Swisscom. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what that does? And if you could also um, touch on security as well in terms of micro-segmentation and um, being able to deal with security in a multi-tenanted environment. Sure. Okay. So <clears throat> it was an interesting journey because when we started the project with uh, Swisscom and Red Hat many years ago, uh, we started kind of designing the cloud for a few set of applications. I mean, you always start with something in mind, a transformation business, and we were providing originally the networking connectivity. At that time, it was more a multi-tenancy problem. I mean, security was kind of uh, reduced towards a multi-tenancy problem, and it was a mainly a networking-driven solution where we had to provide everything that they were used to have in the physical world, switches, routers, DNS, DHCP, uh, security policy, and so on, translated into OpenStack and self-provisioned by the OpenStack uh, APIs and, and Horizon through APIs. Now, as the project kept evolving, what was happening is that the Swisscom Cloud was running a specific application uh, embedded within Cloud Foundry, and uh, the needs went from just providing the networking infrastructure capabilities towards uh, securing the specific workload that Swisscom was running. And that was running containers, containers over the top inside VMs, and so on. So the journey has been that uh, as the project has continued, uh, the stack has become more robust, as Chris was mentioning before, from an operations visibility point of view. But the features and capabilities that the network had to provide had to adjust towards securing the applications and providing the right visibility on what's going on in the applications. So we are working together now on, on kind of the next generation things, but uh, this is the journey where uh, the networking as the end layer in reality means much more when you put things together uh, towards making applications run because it provides some visibility, scale out, and security aspects that are fundamental for running a private cloud. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. And um, Marcel, one of the things I was impressed with was that from Swisscom's perspective, you decided to go for a microservices cloud native um, horizontal PaaS layer, which I think for an operator is quite forward thinking. Um, are you happy with that decision? I mean, has it made life easier? Is it more challenging? 
Um, I think in the end it's definitely worth going that path. Um, the, the, the journey towards there, it, it's definitely has various challenges. Mm -hmm. So w one of the, the, the bigger ones is in a, if you start beginning with it, you need to have a platform where you can easily start um, lots of services. And if we're actually talking about lots of services, then for example, on, on our OpenStack, we're, if we're releasing even new versions of our platform as a service, and which is also built in this microservice um, style of architecture, we're actually um, deploying um, twice every second week we're deploying um, hundreds of new VMs and tearing down older ones so all this life cycle of these VMs are becoming very important and then and that's that's the part of the operator and then as a as someone who provides a platform you actually need to start convincing um, developers adopting to this new schema and concept of of how to build their applications and also to adhere, for example, to the 12 factor manifesto. So, for example, very important don't write into the local file system and configure everything um, through, through service bindings and, and actually start building services um, um, horizontally scalable. And this is sometimes seems to be still very tricky. But um, when, once you have, you, you kind of have the platform for it, and people see how easy it can be to, to actually deploy large, um, large um, platforms using many services, then, then um, they see the value and start doing it. As an example, Dorma Kaba, for example, they redeploy their whole platform multiple times a week, and this is actually a platform that is consisting over like 60 applications, and they're deploying that um, multiple times a week from scratch. And, and, and this is kind of like the, the things when, when we saw that people are building that, that's, that's kind of cool. Definitely. And what about containers and their role in um, getting to cloud native and more scalable platforms for operators. And do you see, um, and Chris touched on this, network functions um, being virtualized and, and also running in containers, or is that you know, too far out there? Actually, <laughs> or, or whoever wants sure to take that. We all have a <laughs> well, we've got, we'll, we'll start with you yes. and then we'll, everyone can answer yes. that one. So from a networking point of view, what happens is that there's uh, many dimensions, right? You create a cloud for an IT application, like uh, the Cloud Foundry based one in, in Swisscom, mm -hmm. but there are many other clouds in Swisscom and in other service providers that they focus on offering networking services. Mm -hmm. In there it becomes uh, more convoluted because what you have is a, a combination of suppliers of technology, you have the OpenStack components, you have the SDN components that glue things, in this case, let's say VMs, and then you have uh, VMs that would run network functions. And those VMs could be traditional VMs from existing networking players that support multi-tenancy by themselves, or, uh, or they are not. They are just VMs with a single networking application. And what happened is that uh, to do POCs and to show how uh, I don't know, a virtual ICP or an AMS solution works is becoming reasonably straightforward. There's enough technology, enough reference designs, enough uh, uh, knowledge in the industry that is, is starting to happen. The problem then becomes, how do I scale it? How do I create a service that I'm going to monetize, that I'm going to support, I don't know, uh, in Europe I think there's uh, 300 million households. So how do you transform those in VCPs? Are you going to use VMs? And are you going to go from 300 million households into maybe six, 700 million VMs? How many servers are you going to need to support that? So what's happening is that there's this trend of saying, I, I have to change that. There's not enough uh, investment uh, available for NFB in order to buy so many servers, so you have to reduce the footprint. And this is where containers kick in. Containers would be kind of uh, the obvious answer, maybe not the only answer, but uh, one of the immediate obvious answers. And what we are seeing is a lot of need of interoperability for NFB clouds between VMs and containers, because there's going to be a transition of how much time it's going to take for traditional VNF vendors to move from 
providing you a network function as a VM and migrating towards a container. Some of them are already available, but some are not. And that's where we see uh, this progressive push to move to containers for NFB, uh, because otherwise it's going to be a capacity problem. Then as Chris was mentioning before, it's not only a capacity problem in terms of how many servers do you need to run the VMs or the containers, is a bandwidth or buckets per second problem. It's like how many servers do you need to handle all the traffic of all these uh, CPs? And this is where technologies that have to accelerate the data path kick in. And now the combination of both, the data planes and the compute structure that you created for your network functions have to play together in order to deliver uh, proper NFB solutions that, that add enough value to be able to do that migration to this new paradigm. Okay, okay. I think it's important to that one, one of the things that, that Perry said was um, it's a broad ecosystem essentially and moving network functionality into virtual machines is, is something that requires many of the vendors to change how they build their applications. And so Marcel's talking about developers that are building IT applications using a, you know, sort of a cloud native development practice, getting uh, VNF vendors to understand cloud native development is something, it's, a, it's an industry level challenge. It takes time to get people to move um, applications from one design kind of paradigm to another. And we're still in the early stages of moving from physical appliances to virtual appliances. So the next step of getting to fully decomposed uh, set of functionality spread across a number of containers to get the density um, and, and even hopefully improve the packet processing performance so you're not paying some of the penalties of overhead of virtualization. Uh, I personally think it's an inevitable outcome, uh, but I also think it's gonna take some time to get there. Okay, thank you. Marcel? Yeah, so actually, um, um, as you mentioned, um, if it starts becoming like the, the, if containers are starting becoming important, how people are packaging their applications, then it's actually a matter like we, we kind of get a very isolated plot that we then can run, but we can then also start running it at scale. And then suddenly um, the, the hype about containers is not about anymore about using the right technology or so it's more about okay how do we solve all all the orchestration problems and and one of, of, of the bigger problems is certainly network there another one is kind of like storage but then also how do we um, shift traffic amongst uh, the living instances because um, as instances are now spawned very quickly they might also die very quickly because um, the need is not anymore there or people are starting to deploy much faster or so so um, um, this 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 might also change another part is also where it becomes very important is that the things that you are actually packaged into that blob are not anymore are not that static but are rather being um, also coming out of a CI-CD pipeline where they are continuously being packaged again and being updated and, and being redeployed. And, and this is one of the things where also um, lots of in investment in terms of um, developing the right tools for it and so on need, need to go into. Okay, thank you. But ultimately, do you think it's a, a positive thing as an operator? Yeah. Definitely. I, I would say as an operator, it definitely makes one of your life easier if you, if, if, if you um, say, well, this is, we take your blob and we run it. Mm. Um, as a platform, as a service, we say we take your code and we run it. Right. Um, but nevertheless, um, people are expecting to, that this thing that you run is still um, up to date, it's still secure, so if something like heart bleeds come out, it needs to be, it's very important that, that you're able to easily update all, um, all of the running applications because what people are expecting is that you're providing a, a secure service. Right, thank you. Um, so we'll move on from uh, containers, though I find them a uh, fascinating subject. Um, to uh, talk about your enterprise customers, um, Marcel, because you now have, um, is it Swiss Re yeah. that is um, 
a yep. live customer. Yep. And they're, you know, some of the most conservative uh, companies in the, you know, insurance and financial sector. So I'm just wondering what sort of questions do you get from them? Um, you know, how do they feel about OpenStack as a platform, as a secure platform for them, and reliability and performance? So, I mean, if, if we look at um, how they are seeing the platform, it's actually for them, it's, it's part of a bigger strategy in moving um, their kind of development model within the company to, to a more agile way of um, moving things out and also being um, able to easily um, answer to to new demands within the company, but also from, from their customers. So what they want is a, is a platform where they can very quickly um, develop um, on top of it. However, they're dealing with, with various very sensitive data. So for them, um, having it being very um, strict and, and isolated in an isolated environment, for, for them is becoming um, very important. So running on premise within our data centers within within Switzerland was 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 one of the the key points for them and all, and then also um, where where Swisscom um, came and, and together with them working on on their broader um, cloud strategy of of how they they do their journey to the cloud um, was was important as well okay thank you and um, in terms of what's next um, for you and, and your partners, what sort of things do you see um, that needs to happen in the future with OpenStack or with other, with SDN or um, any aspect of the solution? Yeah, so we're, we're actually, so we, we started this journey like with over three years ago with a, beta alpha deployment um, and then two years ago it became a little bit more beta official and <laughs> and since one year we're in we're in production and and now as people are adopting things we're evolving also our offering where we're um, where we see for example business demands of that well our applications that are running within the cloud they need they have the business requirement to run within multiple data centers, whether it's for regulations or high availability or, or so. so. So one of uh, the approaches we're doing now is that we're taking the, that platform and we're actually deploying it into multiple data centers, but exposing it to the user as one platform. And so the, the user, the developers, they don't need to care about whether they're deploying into one or multiple data centers. This is the part where we're taking part of it. However, we're not going to take the conventional approach where um, people would stretch infrastructure over multiple data centers, but we'd rather say we want to keep the infrastructure isolated, simple within one data center, and we're actually delegating it more um, to the upper layer. Um, containers are getting more and more traction still, and together with the network, and I think the, the container folks finally figure out that networking is important for them, um, and so does, for example, storage, um, is, is this is one of the things where we're investing more, um, more, more looking into it, um, offering um, the um, possible solutions so that, for example, traffic originating from a certain container is being identifiable outside within traditional network environments. And, um, and on the OpenStack part, um, we started with a very strict set of projects. So we, we, we really looked at OpenStack and we said, well, we need compute, we need storage, we need network. And, and this is how we go for. And now we're adding more and more projects to actually support um, all, all the different deployment cases that we see on top of OpenStack, like we're adding heat, we're adding silometer, um, and, and so on, to, to actually support um, 
the, the people deploying on top of OpenStack with additional tools to, to make their lives easier. Okay, and um, Per, finally get your name right. Um, in terms of you know lessons learned from the um, Swisscom deployment, mm -hmm. um, what do, what would you say are the, are the top ones? Yes, so basically what we learned was that uh, networking in general is a kind of a esoteric uh, uh, field that things kind of uh, magically work. Routing protocols are just the whole thing. Firewalls get configured. And when things don't work, uh, it's kind of pretty involved. Compound to that, when we move towards this uh, SDN overlay, pushing it to the edge and kind of delivering a software solution, uh, what was happening is that networking was becoming even more complicated. And it was uh, going towards spaces like the servers, the traditional networking people were not used to it. So we started working with Cisco Marleon. We were focusing on functionality. But quickly, we realized that as a partnership, when things were not going well, and here we have an expert on uh, finding issues uh, on, on the layer. Uh, there were not enough tools, enough uh, operational tools to understand what was going on. So at some point, uh, we started shifting. We started to introduce products more towards operations and visibility, Cloud Apex, Cloud Secure, and so on, and tools that uh, help to understand a bit more uh, what was going on. So what we realized is this, is every time there is a transition of technology going from, let's say, hardware-defined networks to software-defined networks, it's not only uh, the aspect on how you deliver the capabilities in a more agile way, a better way, is how do you carry the expertise, the visibility, the aspect of troubleshooting the operations, because otherwise, regardless if it works or it doesn't work, uh, people have a resistance to say, well, I don't understand what's going on. And this is almost sometimes is even more important than just the features themselves. That was one of the experiences that we learned working very closely with Swisscom. Thank you. And um, Chris, would you say the same thing? Is it more about operational efficiency and performance troubleshooting, or what would you say are, are the key lessons that you've learned as Red Hat OpenStack? Uh, well, so as I mentioned at the beginning, it really is about getting beyond just the, the the basic functionality and looking at how you run and get insights into your infrastructure because what we're building um, and one of the things that we've learned is actually some cool things that Swisscom has, has done that I think are worth highlighting which we didn't get to cover quite yet which was really um, kind of a forward-looking approach to how you build and deliver infrastructure. Um, so traditionally you don't think of the service provider community as, as really being agile. And these guys have really done an amazing job of, de of deploying, redeploying, looking at how you make your infrastructure um, agile. And that's something that, that we've learned from. Uh, and it's something that we try to take to our customers is help them see how they can uh, build their infrastructure. So you're, you're building infrastructure to produce a platform to run applications on, and you're expecting your application developers to do follow agile methodologies and have a CI CD pipeline. Um, but also looking at how you manage your infrastructure that way, uh, I think is um, something that, that's really valuable for the infrastructure providers. It's a lesson learned for the infrastructure providers. Um, and then the, the key thing for us, I think, is operating at scale. We're building a large distributed system. Things go wrong. And if you don't have tools to dig in to understand what's going wrong, you are dead in the water. Like you're really going to have a major challenges at, at sort of getting things back on track and keeping applications running, which is the end of the day what the, what the goal is here. Um, and then one other thing that I think is really worth highlighting from the particular stack that Swisscom has put together, looking at infrastructure as a supporting cast for an application platform and really like kind of identifying differing layers of abstraction, saying application orchestration is a really important task, and it's done well by certain tools uh, and infrastructure, sort of hardware level orchestration, another important task. So we have the kind of OpenStack substrate supporting a PaaS platform on top, I think is a great way to look at how you bring this, this agility up and down the stack. Great, thank you. So now it's uh, your turn. If you'd like to ask the panel any questions, just raise your hand and we're happy to answer them. Don't be shy. We have a question here.
So the, the question was, is, is OpenStack um, at a stage where an enterprise without the, the breadth of experience and ability to invest deeply, um, like a large scale company, and I think Walmart was your example, um, can, can bring OpenStack into production in their environments. Our experience is absolutely, that's the case. Um, initially, it, it was really challenging in the early days of OpenStack. There was a lot of expertise needed and there was a lack of that expertise across the industry. Um, and part of that expertise was needing to understand exactly the details of, of OpenStack. Uh, as tools improve, deployment tools improve, and, and our focus shifts more towards the operational aspects of, of the cloud and less to the core functionality, uh, we're seeing, just as an OpenStack vendor, we're seeing a lot of adoption into, I guess you'd call it the more traditional enterprise or smaller scale enterprise. And maybe to add some, some grace to that, uh, OpenStack is a project, a community project, that uh, there's multiple flavors on how to consume that. You could get the code and just try to do it yourself. Uh, you could engage uh, with uh, vendors, partners, uh, professional services companies that they are going to provide you support. So what we are seeing is that different enterprises have a different level of tolerance or understanding of the technology. And if you want to get deep into the technology and you want even to get the latest code, the latest feature and so on, you need a certain level of skills. If you are willing to engage with partners and vendors that are going to provide your professional services or support, it's a different level of skill. If you want to consume it as a product, different level of skill. So I think there's enough diversity within the community that uh, you can consume it in any way you want, depending on the level of expertise you have. Now, different enterprises, depending on their size, their budgets, their investments, and so on, will have the ability to consume it in different ways. And that's why a lot of people say, oh, yeah, I try to take OpenStack from the source code living in the open source community and I had issues deploying it. Uh, well, it depends. Maybe if you don't know how to do that, there's other ways to consume it. But as a technology, there's many enterprises that are running now their workloads on OpenStack and getting the benefits of, of the community. Okay, any other questions? Yep, go ahead. So the question is about upgrading OpenStack to the latest release. Um, and so it starts with the, the actual code, the development process within the, the project. Um, historically, the, independent, the individual services, the communication paths between them, um, you, know, you have basic things like ensuring that you have versioned messages in your uh, RPCs passing between services. And uh, so we've spent maybe as a community a couple of years investing into ensuring that, that, that the low level functionality is there to support essentially a rolling update. Uh, and then more recently, the community is, has focused on, call them kind of community level contracts between projects saying, we'll ensure some level of backwards compatibility so that while you're doing a rolling update, one service, um, the, can, a newer service can operate with the rest of the cloud still, uh, still moving forward. And uh, so that's really where we are now. We're, we're finally at a point where you can actually do um, an update from one version to the next without having to um, really re either resort to disabling some core functionality for some period of time, like creating an outage, uh, or, or uh, even the next step was a highly prescriptive way. If you did this in, in the all the steps in the exact right order, you know it will it will function. It'll work at the end. Uh, so we're we're transitioning to um, the community being capable of producing code that's that's upgradable from release to release. Now the next challenge is a wider array of of um, a wider array of versions. So you're going to be able to upgrade from. N to N plus two, um, that, that gets more challenging unless you just do it sequentially. And so I think that's, that's kind of where we are now. And if you look at some, somebody who's being really aggressive and trying to uh, continually update from, from trunk, that's, that's, still, um, that's still not easy to do. Yeah, and, and one of the, the other important things is actually, I mean, um, 
OpenSec by itself must have the capability that you at least maybe can go from version one to version two. The other thing is also that you as an operator need to be able to continuously deploy OpenStack in, in the same way. And, and I think this is where um, also the, the bigger OpenStack community now came together and, and be, uh, became m much better in that by providing the right tools of continuously deployment and um, continuously deploying OpenStack in a consistent way so and but also in an adaptable way and not only the dev stack way of, of, of deploying it so um, so 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 the other part is then also on the operator side that that you actually um, are running you, the infrastructure in a way that, that you can continuously um, redeploy it and because this helps you really a lot. So for example, um, we actually deploy OpenStack once a night on a CI stack like from scratch on the full scale just that all the changes that we do um, that we, we can make sure that if, if if we need to redeploy it again, then, then actually we're able to do so. Because previously we, we had, everybody was working on, on various automation parts, and then at some point when it came together, you had all this burn-in time where, where, oh, this automation needs to fit better together with this one, and by having uh, a pipeline where, where you actually are te verifying all, all these concepts over and over again, you're actually lowering lowering the frictionness and, and then you're actually um, delivering um, um, things way more quickly. So actually um, going from Liberty to Mitaka for us was just a few few days of work in the end. And that, that's the CI uh, approach that I was talking about earlier that Swisscom has done that I think is really noteworthy. So if, you're, if you hadn't heard that before, it's, I think it's really impressive. Okay, go ahead with time. Uh, how do you find the openness of the OpenStack releases? Can you compare that to third party you as a vendor to also, for example, go through the library to test it? And how do you have you had some experience with it? And as you are developing this tool to keep down to how things are working, do you think this tool is to be applicable to different releases in the OpenStack releases? So the question was about how do you do we see the open of, um, um, of of OpenStack and like the different uh, distributions and vendors and whether we see that we can uh, point one tool also to a stack of the other tool. And I think there actually the OpenStack by itself, if we're just following straight the OpenStack API, then we actually get the value out of, of that. Um, because this kind of like makes the clear boundary between um, what you as, a, uh, as an OpenStack um, operator are exposing to the user and people who are deploying um, things on top of OpenStack with their automation tools are, if, if they are speakly only like through the OpenStack API, then for them it's going to be very easy. Um, for an operator, and this is what I mentioned before, is also that there within the OpenStack community, for example, we're heavily using Puppet to, to manage um, the configuration parts on, on top of our system. And before within the OpenStack community, there were various Puppet modules um, flying around, but um, um, developers from Red Hat, but also developers from, from other distributors finally came together and there's like now one um, not one, there are many modules, but like there's like one set of modules under the OpenStack um, tent that all of them are using to deploy OpenStack. And this means like, well, it's, it's whether you're using this one or the other one, it's actually, you use it exactly the same way. And I think things like that are very important. Great, thank you all for uh, sticking with us. We're come up to the end of our allotted time and I hope you found it interesting and useful. And I just wanna say thank you to Pear, Chris and Marcel. Thank you very much.